Let Saban TV in this territory set the pace for the Salvation Army world and beyond. God bless you. Everybody has something that disrupts his or her life. Your addiction is the disruptive force. You are the organism. I'm John. I'm an alcoholic. If you want to get better, you have to give up your addiction from this point forward. If you want to get better, it's up to you to make it happen.
I got involved in, in performing at a very young age. I'm the assistant resident manager here at the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Center. I didn't know how you could just take someone's kids. I'm an attorney, and I feel like I'm contributing to assisting people in resolving their problems. I got involved while I was in my addiction into robbing banks. Addiction came pretty quick after that, and eventually I gave it my soul. Life becomes important again. 
They accepted me exactly the way that I was and never judged me. I currently lead a Bible study. Our relationship as a family has, has grown. The Lord is working in your life and you're a part of a big plan. If you draw nearer to God, He'll draw nearer to you. And I'm living proof of that.
Here's the story of a lovely live chat that is launching soon on Saban.tv. There is room for all who want to join us, and it's completely free. We'll have some chat rooms for Bible studies and a bunch more for group sobriety. You can join friends chatting all together. Click it and you will see. Then the day will come when you will host your own chat. And we know this is much more than a hunch. That our groups will become your second family. And we will talk a bunch. We got a hunch. We will talk a bunch. I will talk a bunch. And like that we will talk a bunch. Woo! Alright, let's get started, folks.
a new Saban TV innovation. Video Bible studies and recovery chat groups have now gone live at savn.tv. Click on the video chat group. Follow the directions here. You can join a group, start your own group, or just observe. Contact Saban TV at the address below if you're interested in leading a video Bible study or recovery group. We will also send you a link with more detailed instruction to assist you technically. Now please listen closely to what I'm about to say. These chat groups are our 21st century street corners, and they are a priority for me and this territory. We're opening them up for one reason and one reason only, to fulfill the Great Commission, our God-given mandate. Not only do you have my permission, but I encourage you to get involved. Let Saban TV in this territory set the pace for the Salvation Army world and beyond. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Out of the darkness in 1865 London, England, one man heard the pleading of God to do more for his kingdom. From that day, William Booth set about creating a church that would serve the Lord with its sleeves rolled up. A church that would serve man soup, soap, and salvation. He responded to God's call on his life and agreed to be counted in. Out of his obedience to God and church, an army was created that would grow throughout the world. Today, we celebrate the goodness of God in transforming our lives, for giving us a new life in Him. We celebrate His goodness. We celebrate His power. We celebrate His never-ending love and compassion. And together, we celebrate His amazing grace. We invite you to stand and sing of God's amazing grace. Is anybody excited? I'm, me neither. When you hear your sinner's name, it's exciting to yell and scream and have fun as we do our roll call. You can sit down, by the way. It's exciting to do our roll call. But one thing I want you to remember as we begin our conference, and that is that God has something for you personally as well. So when we say your center's name for the roll call, please start by your center in unison first saying, count me in. And then you can hoot and holler all you want and make all the fuss. All right, let's just practice that once. All ARCs, count me in. Amen. That's it. All right, wait for your center's name. From the book of Leroy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And it came to pass that in those days the ARC commander issued a decree that the entire Western Territory should ascend, attend an ARC convention. Sorry. 
th this convention was to take place while Commissioner James Nags was emperor, I mean territorial commander of the Western Territory. So 5,100 delegates went to be registered each with their own ARC. Amen. Amen. Delegates from all over the Western Territory traveled to Anaheim, the city of Mickey. Amen. Because each one, uh, wait, we're not there yet, we're not there yet. Each one wanted to be counted in the family of God. And so it was, while they were there, the time came for them to be counted from the Anaheim ARC. Okay, Anaheim, you're supposed to start by saying, count me in. All right, and all the way to Anchorage. All right, God bless you. From Bakersfield. And Canoga Park. And as far east as Denver. From Fresno. And the paradise known as Honolulu. From Las Vegas. Long Beach ARC. And the Lytton ARC. Amen. They all came to be counted in from Oakland. Oops, <laughs> close. <laughs> and Pasadena. Good job. And Phoenix ARC. And Portland. They all cried, count me in. From Sacramento. to San Bernardino. Amen. And from San Diego. Woo. To San Francisco. Woo. From San Jose. And, Sa and Santa Monica. From Seattle. Hey, hey Amen. And Stockton ARC. And last but not least, from the Tucson ARC. They all came to be counted in. Amen. And God brought forth his firstborn son, Jesus, wrapped him in the Holy Spirit, and laid him upon each and every delegate who was willing to say, yes, there is room in my heart for you. Count me in. Amen. There were administrators and resident managers there as well, watching their flocks by night and by day and during the meetings, and during the breaks. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you great tidings of great joy for you and all the delegates. This weekend, God wants to do a miracle in your heart and in your life. Amen. This will be a sign unto you. You will find the Lord Jesus Christ in every meeting and in each other all throughout this convention. Amen. Suddenly, a great company of delegates appeared with the administrators, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. Praise Him, because He has counted me in. Amen. And so it was. When the convention was over, the delegates said to one another, Let's go home and tell everyone what God has done. And so they hurried home to tell the good news to everyone they knew. And all who heard it were amazed at what had taken place. The commander treasured all these things and pondered them in his heart. But the delegates returned home, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had experienced, saying, I have been counted in. And throughout their days, they kept saying, count me in, count me in, count me in. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the leaders of the Adult Rehabilitation Center in the USA Western Territory, Majors Manhe and Stephanie Chong. Good evening, mighty men and women of ARCs. I want to take this moment to extend my very warm welcome to all of you who are here this evening. Whether you are a beneficiary, alumnus, soldier, or a friends of the Salvation Army, I am delighted and glad to have you all. This convention will be a life-changing spiritual experience that connects, unifies, and equips all of us who answered God's call to be His people. As we begin our convention this evening, I want to quickly remind you three things about this convention. First, this convention is all about Jesus. We believe Jesus is the man who said he was who he was and came and died on the cross for our sins. Second, this convention is all about others. All of you are counted in to the kingdom of God, to the family of God. So we must support each other, care for one another, build each other up. Third, this convention is all about relationship with God. All of you are here to cultivate and grow meaningful relationship and po positive and meaningful relationship with God. So in a nutshell, this convention is all about Jesus, others, and relationship with God. And I want you to remember those three things. Will you remember those three things? So, what are the three things I ask you to remember? First, second, third, and I think you are all geared up for this convention. In this moment, 
It is an honor and privilege to introduce to you our territorial leaders of the Salvation Army USA Western Territory, Commissioners James and Carolyn Nax. For commissioners, the ARC has a very special place in their heart. They have a great passion and vision for the ARC ministry and its people. Their vision for the people in recovery community sets a new paradigm for the Salvation Army ministry in this, in this territory. Their desire and hopes for all of us made this convention possible. Commissioner Nag will bring greetings to you all after my, to you all after my introduction of our honored guests. But please join me in welcoming our territorial leaders, Commissioners James and Carolyn Nag. And this time, I'd like to introduce our honored guest speaker for the night, Dr. Steve Audubon. Dr. Audubon is a renowned author, speaker, counselor, and radio talk show host of New Life Live and the founder of a New Life Ministry and Woman of Faith. Please welcome Dr. Steve Audubon, who will bring God's message to us this evening. And this time, I'd like to welcome the members of the Territorial Executive Council. They are cabinet members of the Territorial Headquarters and all divisional leaders from 10 divisions of the Territory and leaders of the College for Officers Training. I'd like to welcome all the members of the Territorial Executive Council. Would you stand as we welcome you? And we have a special guest from the distance this evening. We have a visiting officers, for, visiting officers from USA Central Territory and USA Eastern Territory. And I'd like to welcome ARC command leaders from Central Territory, Majors Graham and Vicki Allen, and all other fellow ARC officers from both territories. Would you stand, would you, as we welcome them. At this moment, I'd like to welcome our retired territorial leaders from USA Western Territory, Commissioners Peter and Grace Chung, and Commissioners Joe and Doris Nolan. Would you stand? Before I invite Commissioners Nax to the podium, I'd like to say this once more. It is my privilege to welcome you all. We have been waiting for this convention for so long. Prepare yourselves to be challenged, excited, inspired, and blessed. Welcome. Welcome to the Salvation Army. Now, once again, please welcome our Territorial Commander, Commissioner James Nag. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is in within me, within me, bless his holy name. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight, say amen. amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, let me give you a little insight about being in the house of the Lord. Because you are the temple of the living God. The house of the Lord would not be the bricks and mortar of the room in which we sit, but rather the flesh and blood of your very self. You are the house of the Lord. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight, Say amen. Yeah. <laughs> How 
Hallelujah. It's a thrill to be here tonight. Now, I understand there are three special words for this uh, convention this weekend. Carolyn, help me out. What are these three special words? Count me in. I was just thrilled with the roll call. What excitement we're hearing. And I learned something new while I was standing over there in the corner. Did you know that Elvis is in the house? He's sitting in the balcony. <laughs> they have a really big Elvis up there. Strange, about three rows big. But uh, that was fun to see Elvis in the house. But we're really glad to see you in the house tonight. We have been thinking about this event and praying for this for a couple of years. And now, here we are. And what is God going to do among us? Who knows? But it's going to be amazing. Carolyn, this is history in the making. I believe so. And what God is going to do in this place and in your life is going to be historic. Amen. God, the Holy Spirit is moving even now in your soul, stirring you, waking you up to the possibilities that God has for your life, even now, even from this place. It's a historic occasion. You know something else? I want to recognize particularly the leaders of the ARC Command, the fabulous, the sensational, the insatiable, the extraordinary Majors Manhe and Stephanie Chang. I think we need to thank God for them. As a matter of fact, to make sure that this is a historic occasion that they will long remember, I'm here tonight to promote you to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel right now with immediate effect. I don't know if they heard you, but ladies and gentlemen, we have Lieutenant Colonels Mon He and Stephanie Chang. God bless you. God is good. All and all the time. God is good. Amen. I'm going to invite you to just stand on your feet tonight as we go to God in prayer and just singing songs. We're going to sing the song that says, Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether worthy. Altogether lovely. Let's sing together.
so here I am. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together. in prayer. Heavenly Father, how blessed we are to be in your presence tonight. We praise your holy name because you are a great God. With your inspiration and wisdom, we were able to start preparing, preparing for this Count Me In convention more than two years ago. And tonight, we are gathered here to worship you, Lord. Father, I pray that during this hour of worship, and throughout the whole convention, only the love of Jesus will be heard and shared with one another. We love you, Lord, with all our hearts, all our minds, and all our soul. Holy Spirit, come. Bless this meeting and each delegate as I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you a question. Can you have salvation without discipleship? My good friend and capable Salvation Army leader, Major Steve Court answers, not for long. Essentially, salvation and discipleship are the bread and butter of the Salvation Army. We see it in every ministry we conduct and in every relationship we foster with God and Jesus Christ. One of the strongest ministries in the Salvation Army is our outreach to people with addictions, principally drug and alcohol. 
I've learned recently that of all those who complete a rehab program in the United States, after 12 months, only 10% are still clean and sober. Now, we ought not to be discouraged about that when we understand the large number of people that actually represents. Consider our joy when we account those who graduate from one of our adult rehabilitation centers. The clean and sober rate after 12 months is 30%. That's three times the average and an indication that we're doing something right. Now understand that of our graduates, for those who connect with the Salvation Army Corps Fellowship, 86% of them are clean and sober after 12 months. The difference is not incremental, it's monumental, and we have to act on it. So, with this important information in mind, we are engaged in what I have called a Harvest Initiative to connect our ARC beneficiaries to core ministries. As it is explained to me, we're seeing three major components towards these solutions. First, relationships. The beneficiary must be led towards a relationship with people in the core, not simply known as one of the men or women from the ARC. Secondly, housing. When they graduate, they often cannot immediately go home to live where the problems in their lives surfaced. We need to facilitate housing near the core to support the rehabilitation and the healthy relationships. Then thirdly, jobs. The graduate must be somewhere there is employment for them. As an important part of their rehabilitation, they need to be able to be independent and have the dignity of taking one's constructive place in society. In the territory then, we are engaging every ARC and local core to work together to consider each of these essentials and how we can integrate our ministries for the advantage of the beneficiaries. Already, we are seeing positive results in certain geographic areas. We are testing our possibilities. In the second year of this initiative, We've already seen the number of soldiers enrolled from ARCs to be triple that of the year before. Now in fairness, the number last year wasn't that high, but we're absolutely doing much better this year, and I believe we're on our way. Today, I'm asking you all to continue to pray for success in this area of our ministries. Each location has different challenges and each beneficiary has unique needs. We need to pull together to honor God in this way. If you're in a core near an ARC, find out from your core officer what you and the core can do to facilitate these ministries. It's a new day and we can engage new solutions for a time such as this. Thank you for your support. I'm grateful to each of the ARC teams who are committed to this endeavor. The kingdom of God will grow and lives will be saved in the name of Jesus. God bless you.
My name is Jen Leggett, and I am currently the supervisor in Brick and Brack at the San Francisco ARC. Several years back, I lost both of my parents tragically. Um, they died within a year of each other. I went through a bitter divorce. I lost my house. Um, I began using drugs and alcohol to cover up the pain. It just sent me into a downward spiral that I couldn't recover from. I ended up being in and out of jail. I got lost in the justice system, and a judge ordered me to come to San Francisco. Before coming to the ARC, I didn't know God in my life. I had not been raised to believe in God. I'd been left to have freedom of choice in that area, but my dad was a physicist, so it wasn't something that we normally discussed. Um, when my mom died, my dad went searching for God, and he found him. And that opened the door just enough for me to consider the possibility. Up until the point when I lost my parents, I had been a diligent worker. I had been a productive member of society. I had done all of those things, had a college education. When I delved into that despair and the grief that I used all those drugs to cover up, I lost all those tools. I lost even how to go outside and be a member of society, basically. Uh, when I got here, I learned how to work again. I learned how to talk about my feelings. I learned how to get up early every morning, make my bed. I was a breakfast cook. You know, I learned how to be serving to others, to get along with others. It had been so long since I had had true, deep relationships with people that it was just a whole new world for me. This is where I found God. This is where I found a new life and a new way to live. Uh, once I got a job here and I continued, I began participating in chapel services. I began participating in other activities. I decided that God had called me to be an adherent. So I took the classes and became an adherent. Well, about mm, four or five months later, I felt a strong pull in my heart that God was saying, it's time to take the next step. This is something that you need to be doing for the rest of your life. This is not a six month thing. It's not a year thing. It's not even a two year thing. This is a lifelong from this life into the next thing. So on November 27th of 2013, I became a soldier. For me, God places calling in my heart. I feel myself drawn to certain people, to certain situations, and down certain paths. When I'm on the path of God's will for me, it's like I have blinders on. I can't see any other road but the one that He has laid out for me. And in my mind, I see Him at the end of the road beckoning, and He's always saying, keep coming, child. Don't give up. I have something better for you. God has placed just this hunger in my heart for more of Him, more of serving His people, more of reading His Word, just getting to know Him more and more. And it's, I've realized that there is no other life that I want to lead than serving the Lord on a full-time basis. There is only one path that I feel that God has placed in my heart that I can accomplish this, and that's through officership. I feel like developing a relationship with God is the most important part in my recovery process. As soon as I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, my world opened up. 
I learned that I didn't have to face what I was dealing with with drugs and alcohol. I didn't have to self-medicate. I didn't have to cover up the wounds with Band-Aids. I could open them up, let God dig his mighty fingers into my wounds and rip out all of that ugliness and pain and despair that I was carrying around. And in doing so, my heart was freed up that he could sow the seeds of righteousness. It's a daily process. It's a lifelong process. And I just know how broken I was when I got here. And now I can walk through life with my head held high. I can look people in the eye again. I feel love in my heart and compassion and gentleness and kindness. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. He can do it for anybody. And it doesn't matter where you've come from or what you've done or what you think that you know about yourself. God knows you. He knows your heart. And he knows the plans that he has for you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome recording artist, singer, and songwriter, Lincoln Brewster. Well, how are we doing tonight? Now, I gotta say, before we get going, you guys feel like you're kind of far away. Now, am I on it? Can you guys hear me okay? All right. I feel like you guys are far away, but that, that's okay. I know, I know that we're actually close together. So I got a question for everybody in the house tonight. How many are ready to, uh, to keep on worshiping God in this house? Now, I don't know what you would do if Jesus came walking in the door right now, but I know what I would do. Well, if I was sitting down, I know what I would do, and that would be I would stand to my feet and begin to give Him the praise and the glory and the credit and the worship that only He is due. How many agree with that? And how many believe that we serve a God who is greater and a God who is stronger and a God who is higher than any other? Come on church, let's sing tonight.
you, Lord. I've got His grace. opportunity every time we get together. I love this about God's Word. I love this about how God's, uh, how He's wired, what His nature's like. That in, in His Word, He says this about, about showing up with His presence when we worship. He says we're two or more. So I, I like that the bar is very low. And how many know we got more than two here tonight? So I don't know about you, that I just always have a high level of confidence that God is, is here when we gather together. And I believe that every time we get together as a body of believers, that God has a purpose for us getting together. Like He always wants to do something. He doesn't want us to walk out of these doors the same way that we came in. Even if you're doing good, even if you're having a good day. God's going, I want you to have a better day. If you're in a low place, God's saying, I want to lift you to a high place. I don't want you to stay where you're at. And you know what? I want you all to walk out of here more like Jesus and less like you. No offense. And I, same for myself. Same for myself. So listen, uh, I won't, I won't talk a bunch here. We're going to lead you in another song, but I just want to give you a little context for, for me standing here tonight. I, uh, I grew up in this little fishing town called Homer, Alaska. Got some Alaska people here. My homies. And uh, I grew up in a home that was, that was full of Domestic violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, just about every kind of abuse you can think of. And at a very young age, I look back now and, and see how God was working behind the scenes, but at a very young age, the enemy tried to come in and steal my sense of, of self-worth and try to destroy my life, like many of you. He's tried to do that. But when you look back now and you see that God was working behind the scenes. And that's what God does. We don't even know it, but He is working behind the scenes all the time, never ceasing, always working on our behalf. And at the age of, of 19, He rescued me. I came to know Christ. I was by myself at a friend's apartment in L.A. And I didn't know what I was doing. I, I just... I had been drugged to church a few times by this girl I was dating, who's now my wife of over 20 years. <laughs> Woo! Go God on that one. My wife is awesome. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, she had drugged me to church a few times, and I'm, I'm at my buddy's apartment, and uh, it was crazy. I, like, he went up to bed, and I couldn't sleep. Anybody ever have one of those when God's like, when God's got your number? And, uh, and I remember just like going, all right, I'm just going to lay all my cards out on the table. 
And I, and I did that, and I felt like, I felt like God was saying, trust me, just trust me. And I said, okay, all right. Um, so here was my version of what we call the sinner's prayer. Okay, so Jesus, can I call you Jesus? Can you do that thing where you come into someone's life and just take over and, and they, just, they just live for you? Because I, I want to do that thing. With that thing that, that you do that I've heard about, will you just do that for me? Whatever that is. Amen. That's, that was my sinner's prayer. And here's what's awesome about the God that we serve is he did it. He was faithful to do it. And here I stand before you today. I've been a worship pastor at my church in Sacramento for 15 years. I've got two sons who both love God. It's crazy. It's crazy to think about the God that we serve and that his love never runs out on us. And you're just looking at a bunch of flawed guys who just want to do our best to serve God with the gifts he's given us. Far from perfect. Far from it. I got a list of issues a mile long. But you know what? It's not stopping me from saying, God, I want you to use my life. I want you to keep using my life. I want to keep growing. I want to keep learning. I want to keep moving forward. I want to keep doing more for you. So I talked way too long, I think. I'm sorry. I get fired up. But I'm so thankful uh, to be here tonight. We are thankful to be here tonight. And we are in a room full of overcomers and champions and people who God has saved. And the Bible says that he who has been saved from much loves much. How many have been saved from much in this house? Woo. Well, I love this next song, and uh, I did not write it. But I, just, I love this song, and I was looking forward to coming and leading you guys in this song. And it talks about the love of God never failing and never running out and giving up on us. This is one of my favorites. Let's worship God in a way like we never have tonight. Can we do that, church?
everybody? Sounds like to me God can count you in. Yeah. If you're like me, there was a time in your life where God could not count you in. Is that true? Yeah. But we, um, we come to the end of ourselves and we turn to God and when He can count us in, I guarantee you, life becomes different. I want to talk to you about that. But first, um, man, I'm staying over at the Hilton. Is that a great hotel or what? Man. You know, I come from a, a little town in West Texas, Ranger. Uh, we didn't have stuff like this. And um, I always judge a hotel by the, how thick their towels are. And man, those towels are thick. And uh, it is going to be tough to get my suitcase closed in the morning. But um, the Ranger was kind of a weird town. You'd see on the supermarket, possum, the other white meat. And um, I remember knocking over a Flintstone jelly jar glass and breaking it. And my mom saying, well, I guess we can't have nice things. Well, I guess we couldn't. This has been such a great thing to be asked to come and speak to you people because we are all fellow strugglers together. We have that in common. And uh, I want to ask you tonight, um, you know, just like everyone else, if God can really count on you and what does that really mean? You know, um, I was talking to my son Solomon, and he wanted me to tell him a story. So I told him the story of William Booth. And uh, when I was done, he said, good job, Willie. And I don't know if that's disrespectful or not uh, to the general, but, but it, was, um, it was an affirmation of what this organization has been about since the very beginning. And I have a little part in that uh, I was one of the editors of the Life Recovery Bible. Yeah. And, um, and just to show you how many people uh, that the Salvation Army helps, the, uh, this has sold almost three million copies, and the largest purchaser of these Bibles is the Salvation Army. So. And this is the King James Version edition that just came out. A lot of people, they want the King James, and so now they, they can get it. Well, um, it is a great joy to be with loud and big and wonderful people. And... Um, And I was, um, I was so excited to get to come here. And I want to share with you uh, some wisdom from my mother to get started. My mother, um, when I was in West Texas, uh, I wanted to, to buy, of course, a BB gun because you learn to kill things when you grow up in Texas. And uh, when I got this BB gun, my mom sat me down and said, now you're not going to be really happy till you put someone's eye out with that gun. <laughs> well, I never put anyone's eye out, but I was never really happy either. <laughs> and I, I would uh, blame it on her, but she had a way with words, and she had three sayings that kind of summed up life in general. The first thing was, it's always something. Now, isn't that true? It is always something. And it will always be something. Um, 1 Peter 4.12 says, Don't be surprised when these fiery trials come upon you, as if it were something strange. No, it's not anything that we should not expect, because it will be always something. And we think that if we didn't just have this one thing, life would be so much different. But if 
Here's what mom said. If it's not one thing, it's another. So if you didn't have this, you'd have that. And I always thought, if it's not one thing, it's my mother. But she didn't particularly <laughs> like that. And, um, but I remember uh, she was working at these beauty salons to help put us, my brothers and I, through school. And she got sick. And she came home and said, I have the one thing that you wouldn't want to have if you were in the beauty salon business. She said, I am allergic to hairspray. And then she said, if it's not one thing, it is another. I mean, that's just the way life is. And then she had this third saying, you never know. You think you know, but, but you really don't know. And, uh, you know, the Bible says, uh, you people, you think you got all these plans and everything, but you do not know what tomorrow brings. I was reading a story about a fishing boat that was out in the Indian Ocean. And the sailors looked up in the sky and saw a cow coming down out of the sky. Now, this isn't like the story some of your pastors tell. This is actually true. And um, he's coming out of the sky. And, of course, they can't move the boat in time. So he crashes through the deck and the hull and sinks this fishing boat with all these men on it. Well, there was a Russian trawler nearby, and it came over, and they saw these men hanging on to boards and stuff, and they picked them up and asked them what had happened to their boat. They said it had been hit by a cow out in the middle of the ocean. Well, when they got back to shore, they found out that a Russian cargo plane, the crew, had found a wild steer out on the uh, tarmac before they took off, they roped it and put it in the cargo hold. They were going to have a big barbecue uh, where they were going. But at 30,000 feet, this, this bull, um, well, it, it, it became untethered, and they were afraid its horns were going to puncture uh, the hydraulic system. So they just lowered the cargo door, and out went running this cow. I mean, you talk about a cow dropping. That thing just, I mean, and... And it was proof that you never know. You, you, you can be in a fishing boat, and you can be sunk by a cow. I heard that out here on the Pacific Ocean, a guy was fishing, and he leaned back to yawn, and at the same time, a flying fish jumped into his mouth, and he choked to death out there fishing. Once again, proving you never know. That's right. That's what mom said. Well, here's what I would say. You never know what God will call you to do. In fact, it's so surprising that he, he usually uses people that are disqualified to do some of the most major things in the world, impossible things. For instance, he went to Gideon, and he said, I'd like you to beat this army of 135,000 soldiers, and, uh, and we're going to whittle your army down to about 300. That's a 1 to 45,000 ratio. So, um, so Gideon says, hey, God, uh, I am the weakest of my family. My family is the weakest family in this Manasseh place. And so you have come to the weakest of the weak. And God says, perfect. That's who I like to work with, to do an impossible job. And of course, the Lord said, go in my strength, not your own. God calls us to do impossible things. You know, when you think about Jonah, it was Jonah and, and this big fish, uh, uh, like a whale. If it had been Jonah and the minnow, I don't think we'd ever heard about that story. Or Noah, it was a flood for the whole world. 
I don't, if we, it had been a little stream of water, I don't think that story would have ever been there. But it was impossible. David killed a giant, not a third grader. I mean, that, you know, we wouldn't even know about that. And, and you look at Daniel, he was in a lion's den. If it had been a hamster cage... Uh, I, and they were nibbling at his toes. And I don't think we'd ever know about that. But God usually calls us at the point of our greatest weakness to do some extraordinary things for him. I have a daughter who uh, was a great soccer player all through school. And uh, when she was in high school, she switched over to this other team, and it was a really good team. And my daughter was always kind of the star of uh, the soccer field. And when she moved over to this new team, she played the worst game she'd ever played in her life and literally uh, lost the game for this team because she was uh, that defensive back right before the goalie, and she just literally let two goals go through, and they were beaten two to nothing. Madeline got in the car with me. She was upset. She was crying. She wanted to not come back the next day for the next game. But I told her, you know, she had made a commitment to the team. She needed to stick with it. Well, I wondered, what's a coach going to do with a young girl who's played the worst game of her life and has essentially lost the game for the team? So the next day, I uh, dropped her off at the soccer field to warm up, and I went to get my uh, Frappe Cappa Latte and, uh, you know, come back to watch the game. And when I drove up, there was the referee out in the middle of the field, and there was the captain of the other team, and there was my daughter Madeline, the captain of our team. In the worst situation, the coach made her captain of the team. And I thought, you know, isn't that what God does with us? You're an alcoholic. He chooses you to be team captain in your area to run, you know, one of the most fantastic recovery groups ever. You know, if you're, uh, you've got an eating problem, you, you work on the recovery and then God... God calls you to help other people with an eating problem. Whatever it is, God calls you to deal in that area. Uh, in 2000, I wrote uh, the book with Fred Stoker, Every Man's Battle. Well, who was I to write a book about pornography addiction and uh, sexual addiction? Because when I was in school, especially college, I thought I knew more than everybody else and I lived a, a very promiscuous life, and, and if you looked at it, you couldn't say it was anything but sex addiction. But here God takes somebody who, I, I knew I had a problem, but I didn't care. I didn't want to change. But one day, what Satan had meant for evil, God would use and turn to good. That's what God does. God asks us to join Him in making the impossible possible. And every person in here has a calling from God that you cannot destroy. You think about Abraham in the Old Testament. He prostituted his wife two times out of fear, and yet God didn't take away the mission that he had called Abraham to. He didn't say, well, now you can't have as many uh, ancestors and, and uh, offspring as the number of stars are in the sky. Abraham couldn't sin his way out of his calling. David was a murderer and an adulterer. But God didn't remove the calling and he was still part of the lineage of Jesus Christ even though he had sinned so deeply. He still was called 
by God. You look at Peter who said, I've never even met Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know who Jesus is. Never been around him. Three times he does that. And Jesus continues to make him the rock, the foundation of the church. And when Pentecost came, it was Peter who was filled with the Holy Spirit because he couldn't out sin the calling that God has on his life. And just, just like William Booth had a mission in life, every other person, from the worst of circumstances, God calls us to get on board with Him. And I want to talk to you about four words that relate to your calling from God. Do you believe that God has called you to do something extraordinary and even impossible? Do you believe God can take all of that pain you've been through and use it for a purpose? I do. I believe it's absolutely possible that the next great movement, like the Salvation Army that started almost 150 years ago, it may start from someone around here who... God could count on to do His will. The first word I want to talk to you about is aware. We need to be aware that God has called us to something and He wants us to get rid of everything that stands in the way of us responding to His call. So whether it's an affliction or an addiction, whether it is uh, something that we uh, has come to control all of our lives, God says, Be aware of that and be aware that I have a calling for you and get rid of it. Well, like I said, I was aware of my problem, but I didn't want to do anything about it. Sometimes we're not aware we even have a problem. You know, uh, with all of the technology and smartphones and, uh, you know, and what I call anti-social media that, that gets us so caught up and everything, we may not hear or see what God has called us to. You know, um, in Psalm 81, God says, Oh, that my people would listen to me. If we're so caught up and busy, we may not hear God's call. Or we may not see what He wants us to do. Helen Keller said, The saddest thing of all is to see a person with eyes that see, but that human being is blind. And so we need to be aware of what God wants us to do and what He needs us to do to get ready to be part of His calling. But being aware isn't enough. We have to add to aware desire. We have to want to change. We have to want things to be different in our lives. We have to desire for God to take us and transform us. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Or another translation says, by changing the way that you think. Now, many of you, your thinking has totally changed, just like mine has. I didn't think God had truth. I thought I had truth. Everything I did was based on my feelings, not on God's truth. And I I had to develop a desire to want something better than I have. And God will do things in our lives that will make us want His will more than we want our own will. And when the pain of doing life our own way becomes greater than the pain of doing life the way God wants it done, we finally want to change. And He takes us ordinary people and does extraordinary things. What we do is we say, well, I just need to be stronger, or I just need to be smarter, or I'm not doing too badly, or I'm not as bad as the next person. And in doing that, we miss what it is that God 
would get rid of in our lives and what he would call us to. But desire isn't enough. The third word is willingness. You have to see it, you have to want something better, and you have to be willing to do whatever it takes to meet the demands of a God who loves us so very much. Willingness. It's the spark plug of change that is lasting. You know, uh, you have to be willing to do some things you don't want to do to follow God. Just like uh, many of you have probably been to an Outback Steakhouse. Well, in the Outback Steakhouse, they have these fried onion blossoms. And these things are delicious, but they kill people every day. (laughs) And, um, you know, if you go in there, look, around the room they have defibrillators uh, to try to, you know, zap people back up. And, um, and of course, they can't save everybody, so rather than take them out front, they take them out back. That's why it's called Out Back Stakeout. And when you're sitting there, you can be aware that they're going to kill you. You can want them not to kill you, but you have to be willing to say no to some things that other people enjoy quite a bit. And, uh, you know, when I stopped drinking, um, I had to be with some people that really enjoyed drinking. And it wasn't easy. But I had developed a willingness to do whatever it took because I was finally at a point where my life had become so painful I couldn't do anything else. I, see, I thought since I didn't experience any consequences from this sexual addiction, I could just continue until I got a girl pregnant in college. And then I, um, I paid for an abortion. I just thought that's what you do. You just get rid of this and, and get on with your life. But I didn't get rid of it, and I didn't get on with my life. I felt so much guilt and shame about two days later, I realized what I had done. I had killed my own child. And I thought it was my job to feel the worst of anybody that had ever done that so God would know how sorrowful I was. But what God wanted to do, He wanted me to confess. He wanted me to repent He wanted me to turn that horrible thing into something for good and get on mission with Him. And, you know, um, no, that's right. That's what God wants for all of us. He wants to reverse what Satan has done. And when he does it, it's an extraordinary thing. Now, here's what happened. I ended up married and we couldn't have any children. And people would say, well, do you think it's because you paid for that abortion that you can't have kids? I mean, there was uh, a lot of shame. And you know, the Bible tells us that you can hit somebody that says something stupid and uncaring to you. Uh, Proverbs says, a fool's mouth calls for blows. So. You can say, in the name of Jesus, I slap you, and uh, tell them to turn the other cheek and slap them again, if it's stupid and uncaring. I tell you, we've got more compassion sometimes for a dog on the side of the road than we do the people who live closest to us. But in 1990, I was in Atlanta, and I was speaking at a uh, charismatic African-American convention And I mean, it was a wild time. I mean, you know, it back and forth the whole way. And after it was over with, this woman came up to me and said, God told me that you're going to have a baby. And I said, well, you know, my wife and I can't have any kids. And she said, I don't care if you can't have any kids. God told me to tell you you're going to have a baby. She had a really bad attitude. And uh, (laughs) it was just pushy, a little pushy. And, uh, And that very day, I had lunch with one of my publishers 
And he said, what are you guys going to do about kids? I said, I don't know. I think we're ready to adopt. He said, my 16-year-old, my, my best friend's 16-year-old daughter uh, has gotten pregnant from a 16-year-old boy, and they can't uh, raise a child. And they're looking for someone to raise their child. So we met them, and they decided we would be the parents of their child. So on Christmas Eve, we went to sleep, but, but we didn't sleep long because we got a call that our daughter, Madeline, had been born on Christmas Eve. And so we traveled on Christmas Day. It's not hard to get a flight on Christmas Day to meet our daughter. And, and they, they didn't give her, for some reason, to my wife. They gave her to me. They put her right in my arms. And it wasn't just a baby. It was God giving back to me the very thing that I had destroyed. Now, that's hard for some people to, to believe. They want to believe that God wants to judge us, shame us, condemn us, but He tells us He did not come to condemn the world. He came to set us free and his grace says to us I will remember your sins no more and it's his grace that needs to motivate us not the shame and when we experience his grace oftentimes we are willing to do whatever it takes to live in his will and respond to him but we need one more thing and that's our fourth word we need to be aware, we need to desire, we need to be willing, and we need to surrender our lives from our way to God's way. Our way, I'm the center of the whole world. And God's way, He is the center of the world. He is the creator of the universe. In my way, in my way I judge God based on my circumstances. But when I surrender, I see God's will and my circumstances working out over time. When it's my way, I will, I will have it now. God's way seems to be always later. I don't know of anybody who's ever said, God's just working too fast in my life. He, it's like He's got all the time in the world. And when... When we find that we have something we've got to get rid of, most of us do what most people do. We ask God to take it away. We ask God to fix it or heal it or cure it. And we end up waiting for God to do what God is waiting for us to do. He is waiting for us to surrender and be obedient. In 1 Peter 4.1, it gives us the reason that we don't surrender and respond to God's call. It says in 1 Peter 4.1 that since Jesus suffered so much, we need to have the same attitude as Christ. And when I read that, I thought, yeah, I've got that attitude because anybody can say they have an attitude. But the second part of that verse was really hard to accept because it said, and until you're willing to suffer pain, you're not really finished with sin. Or until you've suffered, you've not finished with sin. You know, it's painful to give up alcohol. It's painful to give up sex. It's painful to stop eating everything. It's painful, but it's God who takes that pain and uses it for a greater purpose if we'll surrender to Him. And you know what we end up doing? We're not really addicted to stuff. We're addicted to seeking comfort from the stuff. We make comfort our God rather than go to the God of all comfort. Listen to this verse. 1 Corinthians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God 
of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions. Why? Because it says, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves received from God. So God calls us out of our pain to ask others to step out of their pain and into God's will. You know, um, 12-step groups started back in about 1935. And I was able to get a hold of the original, one of the uh, copies of the original manuscript before it was published, of the big book. And it had all of Bill W.'s etchings and writings and crossouts. And the book, the manuscript, was full of references to the Bible, to Jesus Christ, uh, to, to three places. I have a transcript of uh, Dr. Bob's last talk. And there he said, we got the steps from the good book, especially 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, the Sermon on the Mount, and the book of James. And if you ever look at the 12 steps, you can see all of that in there. But in the beginning, all of the 12-step groups were focused on conversion to Jesus Christ before anything else. And, and they called for four absolutes. Absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute unselfishness, and absolute love, which they believed were the four key principles that underlie everything that Jesus taught while He was on earth. They were believers who brought others to Christ and their recovery rate was a documented, out of the Akron, Ohio group, 93% got well when the call was a call to Jesus. And that's why I love what Salvation Army does in the ARC programs. They're bringing recovery back to the Bible and back to Jesus where it was in the first place. So, about 80 years before that, William Booth was preaching those same things. Conversion, obedience, and um, serving other people, like the 12th step, where we, we reach out to others who need help. And God is waiting for us to get to that point where we will serve others and get on mission with Him. And he says, you know, isn't it time that you stop trying so hard and surrender? Isn't it time you start either stop doing everything or doing nothing and just surrender your life to me? And when you do, he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And you know, when you answer His call, here's what God does. He takes even the worst things that are meant for evil, and He makes it look like it was always meant to be. When you look in the Old Testament at, at the life of Joseph and the evil of his brothers selling him into slavery, and yet he ends up running the country and saving his family, and he says to his brothers what you meant for evil, God used it for good. That's what God wants to do. And he makes it look like it was always meant to be that Joseph would be sold into slavery. When my daughter wrote her uh, essay for a college exam, she wrote, I was adopted at birth, but it seems like it was always meant to be. And I felt the same way. When you see Paul wanting to convert the world to Jesus, and he ends up in jail, 
with nothing better to do but then write some letters to the people he wanted to visit. And when you consider uh, more people to understand Christ and come to Christ than he could have ever talked to if he hadn't been in prison there with all that time to write those letters that make so much of our New Testament. And it looks like it was like it was meant to be from the beginning. When you surrender to God, He will transform your life and whatever has been in your past, you don't have to live in it. You live beyond it and one day He will make it look like it was meant to be. That's His grace and His willingness to work with the repentant heart. That's what He does. William Booth, I told my, my little boy, I said he was, he was in a family whose dad had a lot of money. His dad was very wealthy, but when William was a child, he lost all his money, and they lived in poverty. And my eight-year-old son said, what's poverty? So I had to explain that to him. And then I said, isn't it amazing that when he was answering the call of God to preach, the people he preached to were the people he knew best, the people that were in poverty, the down and out, the people that no church wanted to take, even after they had, had had a conversion experience and gotten their life together because of their past, the churches didn't want them around, employers didn't want to hire them. And so William Booth says, why don't you just get involved in helping me save other people the way Jesus saved you? And and, you know, when you look at that life of poverty that William Booth had, and then you see his ministry to people in poverty, you have to wonder, because it looks like it was all meant to be. We say, you know, God, you can count on me. But a lot of times we think, no, I'm going to stick with this lie that I'm not good enough, or I'm not well enough, or I'm not strong enough for God to use me. But God, just like He said to Gideon, rely on my strength. Because it's when we admit our powerlessness to God that all of a sudden we have more strength than we've ever had. And when we say that only God can remove these defects from us so that we can serve Him and we allow Him to do it, life becomes very very different. So, whenever you are faced with whether or not God can use you, I want you to believe that when you're committed to serve others, it doesn't matter what the consequences are. You'll serve anyway. One day, my uh, daughter Madeline, uh, she and I got bicycles the same day, and we were at this little place, there was a hill going up and a hill going down, and before I could get on my bike, Madeline gets on her bike, and she didn't know how to work the brakes, and so there she heads down this hill, uh, and it's on pavement, and she's either going to go off of this ledge, or she's going to hit this dumpster uh, going about 30 miles an hour. So I get off of my bike, run after her. Uh, I had uh, bruises on my heels when I ran out of, uh, I was running barefoot, and then right before she hit this big thing, I just dove and rolled her in, and then I began to slide on the pavement and the little gravel, and I slid for about a half an hour, or at least it felt <laughs> like that. And, and she looked at me, and she started crying because I was covered in blood. I had just entered the Owie Hall of Fame uh, in her mind. But she, she was not hurt. You see, when I started feeling that pain of that pavement, rather than cry, I had a little grin on my face because I then understood why Christ did what He did for us. You see, when you love somebody, you'll, you won't think about yourself You'll sacrifice yourself 
or anything else to respond and do what you need to do. Jesus loved us the way I love my daughter. And Jesus died on a cross out of the same kind of love that caused me to dive and skid on that pavement. Now, I'm not signing up for a bike wreck again, but I got to tell you, I understand God's love because of the pain that I endured. And I am praying that in your life, in this weekend, that not only can God count on you, but He can count on you to surrender your future, a future of service to other people out of reverence to Him. I am hoping that these four words will be words that are meaningful, aware, desire, willingness, and surrender. And that when you leave after this weekend, you will be more surrendered to the God who loves you than you've ever been before. And will God be able to count on you? You think? I believe... I believe that when we say, God, you count me in to your plan, I believe that life really begins. And if you have been at the bottom where I've been, it is such a joy to be with so many people that are full of life after maybe the same kind of death, who are full of hope rather than despair, who are willing to say to God, count me in. God bless you all. Thank you for letting me be here. I love you. I appreciate you. And uh, oh, thank you. God bless you. And have a great, great weekend. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. In His presence daily live. I surrender all. Just like Steve said, it comes to surrender. It comes to surrender. Tonight here in the hall, you see before you a cross in the carpet. God's calling you on the carpet tonight. He's calling you on the carpet tonight to the foot of the cross. And just as Steve has asked, he says we need to surrender. That's right. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. You come, you stand, you kneel, you pray. As God leads you tonight, look at this. That's right, you kneel, you pray, you pray together. Somebody can come and pray with you as well. Give me a... On the first verse, we're gonna sing while so many come. All to Jesus. I surrender all to Him I freely There's room for you at the cross of Jesus tonight. I'll ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. Sing it, breathe it, pray it tonight.
help me in tonight. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. Count me in, Jesus. What you pray? I surrender all. Every way in my life that's not right. I surrender all. Every part of me that wants to do wrong, I surrender it now. on the cross of Calvary, nailed there to the cross, taking our place. We deserve to go there, but Jesus went there for us. He who knew no sin took our sin upon himself, that we might be set free, that we might be saved, that when we sing the chorus, I surrender all, that he would receive us with his arms open wide, just like on the cross of Calvary. Dying there on the cross, in three short days, he rose again from the grave. From the tomb, Jesus rose again with resurrection, life, and power. And that's the resurrection, life, and power for each of you tonight. Those of you who kneel, those of you who stand, those of you who seek God with a pure heart tonight, those of you who say, I, I'm aware of this. I have a desire to follow God. I have a willingness to follow God. I'm going to surrender tonight. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior wholly thine. Let the Holy Spirit witness that I am thine. And thou art mine. Count me in. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior. myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing rest on me. Look at the Spirit move in this room. How wonderful is this? All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself taking it home with me. I'm not taking it back to the old neighborhood. I'm 
going with you, Lord. I'm going to take you there. I'm going to take you with me. I want to go with you. I want you to count me in. The last verse says, All to Jesus I surrender. Listen carefully. Now I feel the sacred flame. It's the blood of Jesus Christ and the fire of the Holy Spirit that comes into our lives. Oh, the joy of full salvation. Glory, glory to His name. Hallelujah. All to Jesus it out. Here we go. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my precious Savior, I surrender all. I'm going to ask all of you tonight while the, while the music still plays. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you came and prayed up here tonight, I'm going to ask you just to stand right where you are. Just make sure you're standing right now because I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to thank God for your willingness. I want to thank God that you've been aware tonight. I want to thank God that he put a desire in your heart. I want to thank God that he gave you the willingness to come forward and bring your life to Him and to surrender to Him here and now. Loved ones tonight, if you come to pray here tonight, you need to talk to your uh, ARC officer. You need to make sure that your, your, your leaders from your center know that you have come and prayed. You need to say to them, Cap, I gave my heart to God tonight. Now, now you, might have, you might have given your heart to God before, it doesn't mean you had to get saved again. But you just had other things in your life. You just wanted to make sure that everything belonged to God. And you did it tonight. Make sure you tell that to your officer. Make sure that they hear from you personally. So they can look you in the eye. So they can write your name down. So they can pray with you. And by the way, if they're not ready to pray with you, you pray with them. Amen. But I, I, I have a feeling they're going to want to pray with you. sing the chorus one more time. I'm going to pray. And God is having his way in this place tonight. Amen. I surrender all. We thank you tonight, Father, because you have come into this place. You have, you have been present among us. And your Holy Spirit has moved in the hearts of countless people. I thank you, Lord, for my friends who have surrendered themselves to you tonight. Please, Father, by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, have your way in them. Make them right. Forgive them for their sins. Set them free. Set them free from the chains that bind them. Help them with their addictions. Help them with the complications in their life. Help them with the guilt that they carry. Help them with the situations that they don't think they can overcome, but that they know through the message tonight, the message of your holy word, that they can overcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, bless them tonight in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.
excited tonight. Amen. I want to thank Lincoln and Stephen. Would you thank them? And the praise band and the chorus and the band. And let's thank God for what he's done tonight. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you and praise you that you are faithful to do that thing that we heard about in our lives, faithful to turn evil to good in our lives, and even greater things we can't even imagine. Help us to hear your call. Give us the desire and the willingness to step forward into your plan to let you be God in our lives. Make us remember the promises that we're making today, tonight, for the next weekend. By your mighty power in our lives, help us to do what we have promised. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We trust you. We thank you for what you have done. Be with us and keep us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, before you leave, just few quick announcements. We have snacks out here, but you have to hurry, okay? You have to hurry because Lincoln's coming back in about 15 minutes right here for a concert. If you have kids in childcare, you absolutely have to get them by 11 p.m., okay? Get them by 11. Now, guys in the air seat, before you start moving, what's, what's the rule about coming to chapel? You have to be there 15 minutes early, right? If you're, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. 
so tomorrow's meeting starts at 8.30. That means you have to be here at what time? 8.15, that's right. So let's just go on out and then come back as quickly as you can. Go ahead. Thank <laughs> you.